salty Ooh. this morning. Jump right into it. I love Tana's power five. She always does a, a, a really good job with it. But one of the reasons I really liked it today specifically is because it, it's tying in a lot to what we're talking about. Because what are we talking about today? Identity, right? And in that identity, we're looking at the word authority. So we've been talking about identity for a while now. Obviously, we've gone through value, we've gone through purpose, and today we're, we're working through, through authority. And uh, I just want to jump into it because we just have so much to get through with authority. So I'm going to do a quick, a quick bit of recap um, just to bring you up to speed if you weren't here last week as that phone goes off over there. <laughs> so we talked about what is authority, right? We talked about the fact that authority means rule. It, it's, 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 a, it's a position, but it's not just a position, right? We talked about how the greatest authority in, on earth was who? Jesus, right? We talked about how when he went out into the, into the wilderness, his authority was challenged by Satan, right? So he went out, and uh, what did Satan do? He said, look, I've got this. Uh, you, you've been hungry. You, you're, you're starving. You've got all this stuff. You see these rocks turn him into bread. And, and what's he doing is he's challenging the authority of Christ because Christ could, if he wanted to, turn those into bread. But what was Christ's job? What was it? Remember, we tied back to purpose. His purpose was to die so that every single one of us could be bought with a price. So Jesus came down to fulfill his purpose. I want you to catch that for a moment. Jesus' authority didn't overrule his purpose. This is a really important key. Jesus had the authority to turn those stones to bread. But his authority didn't overshadow his purpose. We need to make sure as Christians that that's something that we're very careful of. Because as we grow in our walks with God, as we get more and more authority, we need to make sure that we don't overstep what God has called us to do and start making it about us. Because Jesus could have done that, but he didn't. And he had all authority to. The greater we talked about, the greater the authority, the greater the responsibility. And out of the greater the responsibility, you also needed to have a somewhat of a knowledge base. You had to understand authority. You can't enforce the law if you don't understand the law. We use the analogy of a police officer. If a police officer is going out and helping everybody in the city, doing their job, giving speeding tickets, you have to know what the speed limit is if you're going to give a speeding ticket. You have to know what your rights are, what the, what the person you're giving the job the rights are. Did you know that the world has... Has, has a certain identity, even without Christianity. We talked about this under value, that the world, human beings, have a value, a purpose, and authority, right? Do you remember what those are? So as human beings, our value is that we were made in the image of God. Our purpose is that we would go out and we would reproduce, right? It says go into the world and multiply, and our authority was dominion over all the earth. This is human identity. If you are a human... This is part of what you're supposed to do. So now we're talking, uh, we've moved on to authority, and we're talking about authority as Christians. We have authority as Christians. We also talked about um, that if we're, we're going to walk in God's full authority, we need to understand God's parameters. Okay? That's really important. If you don't understand the parameters with which you can operate, then your authority starts to disappear. I'm sorry about that. We're to walk in them, and then the last thing we talked about was that we're to walk in these things because this pleases the Father. Our authority on earth was given to us, and so when we obey, when we walk, when we do what God called us to do, it's pleasing to him. Jesus knew his Father's word. His word was made flesh, and he had all authority. So all of authority comes from who? God, right? God's the one who establishes authority. He's the one who gives authority. He's the one who says, you, ha you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, so on and so forth. And so when Jesus says, I have all authority, why is he saying that? Because the Father gave it to him. I think it's important to remember that, that it's the Father who established all of this. I, I also find it interesting that when you hear Jesus' explanation to the disciples when he's teaching them how to pray, I, I know I've heard it lots in Christian circles, and I'm not trying to pick on people for doing this because I honestly, I don't think it's a really big issue. But a lot of us say, well, Jesus, help me. Jesus, do this. Jesus, do that. And I find it interesting that we're praying to Christ when Christ said, if you want to pray, pray to the Father. 
The very first part of what he said was, Our Father who art in heaven. Where is he putting the focus? God. The Father. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. What's the next thing he's saying? God doesn't matter what happens on this earth. Your will be done. What's his will? God's authority. What God wants to happen should happen. And the reality of it is what God wants to happen will happen. <laughs> it's just whether or not we're part of it. Right? So these are a few things. This is kind of a really quick recap. We, talked about, we looked into Matthew 28, 18. Um, where it says that Jesus has all authority. We looked at Matthew 4, 1 through 11, where it talked about Jesus being tempted. So now we get to move on to some beautiful parts about authority that I think we, we really need to look into to fully understand our jobs as Christians when walking in this life. Because we can't take authority out of our Christian walk. It has to be there. And I think one of the reasons that the church is in the state that it's in in North America is we have a huge lack of understanding when it comes to authority. Like a massive lack of understanding. And I think one of the reasons for this is because we've seen authority be abused and therefore we've now removed ourselves from ever being under authority. I'm going to say that again. We've seen authority being abused. You've seen it in pastors. You've seen it in church leaders. You've seen it in elders. And so what did we do to guard our hearts? We've now said, I am no longer going to place myself under any form of authority. And so now we're doing away with the things of heaven. You see, the thing is, just because something good is corrupted doesn't mean that it stops being good. Lots of marriages don't work because they're not done God's way. That doesn't mean marriage is bad. The same thing applies to authority. And, and I find it so interesting because we'll look at it a little bit later. But if your pastor looked at you and said, hey, you know what? You really want to walk with God. You really want to do this. You have to do this. How many people would respond with, yes, sir? Well, Jeremiah, where does it say that in Scripture? I'll show you. Because there's a certain level of authority that God gives to those who are called to be in the fivefold ministry. There's a certain level of authority that comes to those that aren't in the fivefold ministry. If you're not in the fivefold ministry, you have some authority to walk in. If you don't walk in that authority, you're not fulfilling your purpose. And that's important because the Jesus, or Jesus said that if, when, when he comes to do the, the, the test, the judgment, he's going to trim out the tree and he's going to burn it and he's going to see whatever is lasting is that which had value. And if what you did did not last, the, the works that you did did not have any good foundation, they weren't done in his name, they will crumble. And therefore they will be cast aside. And wh what does that even mean? Well, let me tell you if, you, if you made your entire life's purpose about having a nice home, about having a nice car, about making sure everything looks pretty, having the best Christmas lights, making sure that you have the best food, you know, everything just looks good for you. If that's been your purpose, when God returns and says, what did you do in terms of eternity? He's going to test it against all of your works. Did your works accomplish anything? So what kind of works gets tested and stands the test of God? Let me tell you, things when you walk in your authority, when you invest into your children and you say, look, I love you. This is how God wants you to be raised. And so I'm going to enforce this in your life as an authority. An authority, you as parents are an authority over your children until they leave. As an authority, you're responsible for the upbringing of your children. When you do that properly, you get a long-lasting result. Here's the other part. When you're, let's say it's maybe your children are gone, whatever, you're doing your own thing. Now you've got your circle of friends. Who here has a circle of friends? Who here, a little bit, that's, that's about that big. Okay, If you're in the middle, this is probably your circle of friends. Uh, I can't remember what the exact number is. I think it's like 12. The, the majority of people can only have 12 close friends. After that, you cannot have any more time invested into that. So then your circle expands to your acquaintances. Right? So after that, you've got your circle of acquaintances. These are people that you, you may work with, you may have a, a basic understanding of, but they're not the people that you meet with on a regular basis. They're not the people that are always going to be reaching out to you when they have questions. And then you've got your acquaintances. And then you go a little bit further. So maybe you've got influence with these people they know of you. You may not know them. A really good example of this is, is like politicians or superstars or pastors who you may not, you may be online. You have a lot of people who listen to you, but you may not know all of them. So it's an extra large circle of influence. What we do 
with our authority affects all of those different circles of influence. Those who are closest to you have the greatest level of impact by being close to you. When you are a light and you're in a dark room, the closer you are to that light, the more that light affects you. Right? This is pretty basic. The further you are from that light, the more difficult it is to see. Now, if every Christian decided, I'm going to live like a light, it's going to be kind of hard to avoid growing. It's going to be kind of hard to avoid dealing with what's inside of you. See, the problem is, is so many of us, and I'm not talking necessarily about this church, but church in general, Christians in general, and if this does apply to you, I encourage you to change. But what we've done is we say, I follow Christ, I believe in God, I'm a Christian, but you never turn your light on. And I loved it because Hannah said, when, when one of the questions when Hannah was telling me this story originally, she said somebody at her work looked at her and said, what do you believe? And if your answer to that is, well, I'm just a Christian, great. Now you've established that they have no clue who you are. <laughs> Other than you fit into this really broad category that could mean any number of different things. What do you believe? If all you can do is say, I'm a Christian, but you can't give an account of your faith, you're never turning your light on. Why? Because you'll never influence somebody to follow you just by giving your title. You see, authority isn't tied to your title. It's tied to your works. We're going to look at that in a little bit. There's gr there is a form of authority in your title, but that is limited to the parameters that God gives you. Jesus never went above or beyond the parameters that God gave him to work with. Therefore, he was operating with full authority the way God intended him to. What happens when we decide to take our authority and we step outside the parameters of God? We now are stepping into something we no longer have authority to do. When we step into something we no longer have authority to do, we're now doing it in our own strength and we're no longer capable of producing from God's will. It starts to become producing from our will, which is fruitless. Those are the things that will crumble and burn when God tests us. Jesus knew his father's word. He knew it inwardly. He, the Bible says he was the word made flesh. See, I, I, I love the example. Um, I'm going to give you guys one of the examples. A physical example that's easy. The Texas Rangers. Okay, so if you go to Texas, the Texas Rangers are like these super cops, okay? When you, when you go in there, you've got your regular Texas police force. But then when a ranger shows up, the authority level goes from here, which is police officer, to way up here. And in case you didn't know, the Texas Rangers still today have the authority to start a war on behalf of Texas. That's how much authority they carry. If something goes wrong and they're present and they decide, I need to go to war with you, they can now enact war on behalf of the entire state. I don't know about you, but I'd call that authority. But within that great amount of authority are parameters. Because if they decide to start a war outside of the parameters that was established to them by the state, they may be able to do it, but the consequences of those things will be extreme and that person will lose their position. Why? Because that Texas Ranger doesn't have authority in his own strength. He has the authority given to him by a greater authority, which is who? The state of Texas. In our case as Christians, God says, you know what, you can go out and you can change the world, you can do all of these things, and you can go out and make a difference in the world, but if you don't follow the parameters I established for you, you're going to just make a mess. And then God will remove that authority from you. Jeremiah, God doesn't do that. Yes, he does. The Bible says he won't remove a gift, but I can guarantee you he removes authority. And we're going to look at a few of those opportunities today. I've, I've heard from a number of people in, 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 in my circles that, will well, Jeremiah, every Christian has the same authority. This is not true. This has never been true. Right from the get-go, God always had people who had more authority than others. And if you look carefully, 
the, different, the, the factor that affected this was a heart turned towards God. Those whose heart was closest to God, was most obedient to God, was most willing to work with God, had the greatest level of authority. Those who said, you know what, I'm going to follow God up to a point and then eventually I'm just going to kind of do my own thing or, you know, pride starts to set in. Look at what I did. Look at what we're doing. This is important to see. Hmm. We talked about gifts. Gifts are part of it, but they're not authority. They're not full authority. I'm, I, I love in the Old Testament, there, I'm going to be really vague with this because I don't remember exactly where it's found right now. There's so many examples of it. There's an instance where they're trying to find an answer from God. So they're asking all of these different prophets all these different questions. And it's like, come in and give me an answer. Come in and give me an answer. And they're asking all of these prophets. And all of these prophets are giving this king the answer that this king wants. And this king's like, okay, great. But I, I feel like I still haven't gotten the answer I'm looking for. And so he's like, is there nobody else who can give me an answer? And one of the king's representatives comes up and says, well, there's one guy. And the king looks at him and says, but that guy never tells me anything I want to know. And he's like, well, bring him anyway. So he brings this prophet in, and this prophet comes up, looks at him. And this prophet tells him exactly what the king wants to hear because this prophet believes, you know what? This king's not going to care anyway. So the king's like, wait a minute, you never agree with me. Can you please tell me the truth? So the prophet says, fine. And then gives him the advice he did not want to hear. In this case, it was don't go to war. And the king's like, rah, 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 whatever, rah, 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 and goes to war. <laughs> and guess what happens? He lost. Here's the thing that I'm trying to get at. There were a lot of prophets who came to give words. There was only one who truly heard from God. I mean, it's possible the others heard from God, but weren't actually willing to say the truth. We have a lot of prophets in today's day and age. A lot of people who like to say what the people want to hear. That's what those prophets were in the Old Testament. They told the king exactly what he wanted to hear. But a prophetic word from God is very rarely what we want to hear. Because what is it? A prophetic word from God is often, you're here, here's where you could be. This is what you need to do to get there. Because God's more interested in where you're going than where you're currently sitting. God's more interested in your eternity than he is in your temporary comfort. God's far more interested in the reach you will have as a Christian to do. even Because sometimes we like to think, well, you know what? If I just act a little more like the world, I might be able to speak to 10,000 people instead of 500 people. This is legit one of the ways we think as Christians. But if you reach 10,000 people and tell them about a God that doesn't exist, or you reach 500 people and you tell them the true word of God, which one's going to be more effective? The smaller number. Why? Because you're actually showing who God is. Jesus picked 12. 12 people changed the face of this planet following Christ. And everybody's like, well, if, if I don't have a great influence, I, I need to say something that's not going to offend people. We, I was talking with a fellow the other day, another pastor in town, and I, I loved the analogy because there was, there was this big kind of a divide in these pastors. Like, well, we need to build bridges with the world. We need to build bridges with these people. We need to, we need to find a way to build a bridge to get them across. And we looked at each other, and I loved the perspective. It was, wait a minute, when I built a bridge, yes, I can get across but they can also get in. Let me ask you something. If you knew there was a tribe on another island across from you that was trying to murder all of your citizens, would you build a bridge to them in the hopes that you can go over and make peace? It, it's not practical. This is why God said, I don't want you to be a friend of the world. I want you to be in the world, not of it. 
Be constantly being renewed. Renew your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. Be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Everything in Scripture says, don't build bridges. Go over and shine a light. Why? Because our job is to have a certain amount of authority that lines up with our purpose. And who remembers what our purpose is? To show the will of God. Our will is to, sh- or our part, not our will, our purpose is to show the will of God. We're literally show pieces. Hey world, you want to see what God looks like? Look at me. The imperfect representation of God. That's what all of you are. Ambassadors. Your job is to represent kingdom values on earth because that's the kingdom that matters, not this one. But I want to show you guys a couple things, okay? So we talked a little bit about the fact that leadership is not necessarily just position. It's also tied with authority. Or authority isn't just position. It's tied with work. So I want to go there for a moment. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. I'm going to go there as well because it's a bit of reading. So Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. And I want to show you guys something. Everybody here knows who Peter is? Yeah? Good. Everybody here knows who Paul is? Everybody here knows that Peter was considered the head apostle? Okay. Paul was considered what? The apostle to who? The Gentiles, right? Okay. So in terms of position, who had the greater authority? Peter did. All right. Keep that in mind while we read this. Because there's going to be moments where... We sometimes as pastors like, I hate this. Sometimes pastors will say, you just need to do what I said because I said so. That works to an extent. If what they say is against this, you have no obligation to follow through. Here's why. Verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is Peter, by the way. um, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of some men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and separate himself, fearing those from the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, and the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, who's he talking to, by the way? Paul is talking to Peter and saying, you're being a hypocrite. Did, did, did he pull Peter aside quietly? What did he do? In the presence of all. <laughs> Jeremiah, that's so mean. That's not very Christ-like. In the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through the faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Since by works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners in Christ, then a servant of sin, far from it. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a wrongdoer. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but who? Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. So what's he doing? You gen- you. Mr. Peter, are doing something you're not supposed to be doing. Yes, you may be the head apostle, but here's what, here's what we said. You are not to expect the Gentiles to live the way the Jews live. Now, are we talking about the Ten Commandments here? Is that what he's talking about, the law? No, what's he talking about? You see, the, the Jews had this responsibility to guard the precepts of the Jewish faith, which is God's laws, God's, God's in-depth laws. That was a responsibility given to the Jews. The Gentiles still have the Ten Commandments plus the four we talked about way back when. We have a responsibility to follow through on, which is to look like kingdom. But what what was uh, Peter doing? He was saying, you have to look like us Jews. 
You have to be circumcised. You have to come and celebrate our feasts. You have to eat the way we eat, drink the way we drink. You have to do the way we do things. He's essentially saying, wait a minute, because you're not like us, you're not as good as us, and therefore you're not as holy as us, and we won't associate with you. A couple of points in there I want to point out. One, the blood of Christ covered every single one of us when we're in him, when we're obedient to him. The second thing was, what were they doing? They were treating the Gentiles who were Christians like the world. What were they doing? We're not associating with you. Mm. That doesn't sound very Christian. What they did to the, with, to the Gentiles was not okay because both of them were paid for. The Jews and the Gentiles were paid for by Christ. But here's the thing about authority. We have a responsibility to be different from the world in such a way. Part of our authority means that we're not hanging out with sinners in a way that produces a friendship without change. Let me give you a really good, ex a practical example of how that would look today. The police chief is going to dinner regularly and hanging out with the drug lord of the city. How does that look? Not good. Why? Because one has a responsibility to do what is right. One has a responsibility to do what is wrong. So when you end up in a friendship with those people, do you know who wins? Those who have a responsibility to do wrong. Because when you don't deal with what's wrong in front of you, when your job is to deal with what's wrong in front of you, you are no longer doing your job, but they're still doing their job. Our job is not to be friends of the world. Our job is to be light and salt, which means, wait a minute, you're in sin. Boom, here's the spotlight. Ta -da. This is where you need to do to change, repent, and be baptized. That's our message. Everybody say this. My message to the world is repent and be baptized. My message to my brothers and sisters is the same. Repent and be baptized. When I see a Christian walking in sin, it's not, oh, poor you. I'm sorry you're feeling this way and that you're walking away from God. No, repent and be baptized. If you want to follow God, get on the right track. But it's hard. Yes, it's hard. Jesus said narrow is the path to salvation, but broad is the path to destruction for a reason. Because following Christ requires a certain level of discipline. That's what disciple means, guys. Disciple comes from the word discipline. When we discipline ourselves, what does discipline mean? It means that every single day, you grab that Bible. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Father. What does that mean? Grab your Bible every single day. And you live by it. Don't just read it. The Bible says don't lie. Guess what? Don't lie. The Bible says don't steal. Guess what? Don't steal. The Bible says to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, guess what you got to do? If the Bible says that when you see someone in sin, you're supposed to confront them in their sin, it's not wrong, despite what culture tells you, to confront that person. If you see somebody who's, lit, who's literally on fire, and you have a fire extinguisher, and you watch them walk by because you don't want to be rude, what kind of person are you? I know this is hard. This was hard for me to grab, and I'm the kind of guy that likes this kind of stuff. It's hard to imagine because culture is so politically correct that our job as Christians is to represent culture well. Peter went in, or Paul went into a city. No, it was Peter. Peter went into a city, preached the gospel. They stoned him to the point where they thought he was dead, dumped his body outside the city, woke up, it's like, whoa, I'm still alive. Gets back up. God, I need more boldness. Go straight back into the city that stoned him and starts preaching again. I'm not saying all of us are called to be that, that intense about it, but there had to be something inside of Peter that said, it's worth me sharing the gospel to the point of death despite what happened to me. And it wasn't the gospel of Jesus loves you. It was the gospel of go, repent, and sin no more because Jesus paid for you. 
You see, we've, we've changed the gospel from repent and be baptized to Jesus loves me, this I know. That has to change, people. Jesus' love, the Bible says, Jesus so loved the world. This is the only part in Scripture where you'll find this. And the word is past tense, meaning that it was expressed at that point. Jesus' love for the world was expressed through the dying of him on the cross to pay for sins. What does that mean? It means he said all of the world, mankind, has the opportunity to be saved if they would only come to me. Jesus wants every, it says God's will is that every man would be saved. And man meaning mankind. But there's a but. If you don't serve him, you're part of the enemy's kingdom. Which means that our job, and we really need to go like kind of medieval here for a moment. You don't want the enemy having spies in your kingdom. You don't want the enemy having saboteurs in your kingdom. If war, our job is to represent Christ, we need to make sure that the word's being spoken, that what's being brought out, that's part of our authority. We're supposed to enforce the God's creation on earth. We're supposed to say, wait a minute, this is what the Bible says is true. This is what the Bible says is just. This is the heart of the Father. Yes, it is that you would all be saved, but it also means you have to change. In this particular case, Peter technically had a greater position than Paul. But what was, what was the greater authority? What had been established is God's law. It was because of that that Paul could look at Peter and say, you're doing wrong. And if you, if you continue through that story, Peter was the, was the right kind of leader because what did he do? I'm sorry, you're right, please forgive me. And then changed. Why? Was it because Paul had a greater level of authority? Or was it because the word was the authority? And the position was the requirement to enforce it. You see, we have to change how we see authority in the church. That does mean that there's a reason Jesus said, I don't, it's, it's better that not all of you, I think it was Jesus or it was Paul, I can't remember now. It's, uh, it's better that you not want to be teachers because if you're teachers, you're held to a higher standard. And when you're held to a higher standard, you're judged by a higher standard. That's a scary thought. We don't often think about that, but when you stand before God and the rest of culture is wiped away and you're, f you're faced full-fledged by the kingdom principles, God is standing in front of you, looking and seeing everything about you. Now all of a sudden you wish you had paid a little more attention to God's word and a little less attention to the people trying to tell you that God's not real. It's so interesting because the word of God sounds harsh to those who are not in Christ. But when you're in Christ, it's like, well, duh. Of course we have to follow him. We're part of, he's the king. It doesn't make sense to the world, and it shouldn't, because their eyes are not capable of seeing it until the Holy Spirit comes and somebody teaches the gospel. You know, the, until we start changing it from God loves you to repent and be baptized because he paid for you, we're never going to see true results in this world. We have a lot of people who came to Christ and never trans let, the, let Christ transform who they are. And so you know what ends up happening is they leave the church. Everybody's like, well, the church is growing. No, the church is, is, is diminishing. And those within the church aren't even always there. They call themselves Christians. The Bible says that they, they represent God, but they have no power in their lives. There's no representation, no heavenly representation, which is tied to your authority. Can you imagine if a police officer, all he did was walk around in his police uniform all day and say, I'm a police officer. And you kind of look around, you flash your badge around, and all of a sudden you see a store getting robbed, and you just look, I'm a police officer. And then you walk away. And everybody's like, are you going to do something about this? No, I'm a police officer. That would be rude. How dare you suggest that I go and stop that guy? 
Who do you think I am? God? It sounds silly when you say it like that, but that's what we do as Christians. Well, how, how dare you assume I should go tell my friend that they're in sin? Who do you think I am? God? Ever heard that one before? You don't have to be God to help people get back onto the right track. God's the only one who will be the judge, but your responsibility is to be out in the streets being light and salt. I, I made a post on Facebook the other day. The problem with being a candle is that you are called to be a city on a hill. See, sometimes we're fine with just being this tiny little light, but that's not your calling. A city on a hill is a beacon. It's standing up in the middle of the darkness. There's this one bright light. And I don't know if you've ever seen, I live out of the city. About 30 minutes. And one of the things that you can do from where I live is you can see this aura going up into the sky of light because there's a city there. If you were lost in the middle of the wilderness and you saw a big bright light going boom up into the middle of the sky and you needed refuge, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go to that city. And yet so many Christians just want to, I, I want to show my light. I don't want to stand out because if I stand out, I might offend somebody. If I, if, I, if I were to say something, I might lose my influence with those people. You know how many parents I've seen who have adjusted who they are to accommodate the sin of their children so they don't lose relationship with their children? They'll literally, they'll, they'll do things that are worldly to try and accommodate their children who are worldly in an attempt to not lose relationship. You know what's more powerful is to say, I can't do that because the God I serve would not like it. And therefore, the sin that's in me is no longer going to rule me. My love for you is not greater than my love for God. And the only way I'll actually win you over is if I show you that serving God has greater reward than serving the world. Our job is to be powerful people. Everybody wants to be powerful, but nobody wants to walk in real authority. Because real authority also has consequences. The greater your authority, the greater your requirement to walk in line with that authority. I just recently had a discussion with somebody on Facebook about they, they had this post out there, and it was this Christian thought, you know what, it's a really good idea to go out and tell the whole world that I'm going to a strip club. I'm like, huh? No. And we had a very public correction. Why? Because it was important that that person understand if you want to represent Christ, you can't do so by representing the world. They are two mutually exclusive concepts. You can't have a room like this with lights on and it be dark. See how that works? If it's dark, there's no light. If it's light and you prefer darkness, you're now uncomfortable. Because the Word makes you uncomfortable. There were lots of times when I was growing up as a young person where it said, honor your father and mother for this is the first promise with a reward. I did not the greatest at that growing up. Every time I read that, it was like a, oh, I don't like that. You know what I would do is I would justify myself. Well, God, they just don't deserve my honor right now. Anybody ever justified your sin? You know what? When I finally matured a little bit, God looked at me and said, I don't care. Who do you serve? Who do you serve? See, one of the greatest points about authority is you need to remember the one you represent. That's what Paul did. Wait a minute, it wasn't about Gentiles or Jews. This is about God. Get in line. Paul said, you know what, you're right. I'm sorry. Peter said, you know what, you're right, I'm sorry. Because the greatest authority was God's word. If you have a pastor who's telling you it's okay to lie, you, whether you're in five-fold ministry or not, you can look at that pastor and say, you're wrong. Here's what God's word says about liars. And if that pastor looks at you and says, you can't say that to me, run. You have a bad pastor. You do. You have a pastor who's probably filled with pride and arrogance and God will judge him. 
Because God's word is the ultimate authority. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. How are we doing for time? 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 34. I'm going to end with, hopefully try to end with these two because it'll take a bit to get through these. So 1 Samuel chapter 15. Jeremiah, you're going to the Old Testament? Yeah. Did you know that the uh, entire New Testament, all of the revelation that the disciples got was from Old Testament writings? Yeah. The New Testament was written on the foundation of the Old Testament. So when people say, well, the Old Testament's done and passed away. No, no, no. The Old Testament is what gives strength to the New Testament. Because Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, meaning what we did before isn't gone, I just came to fulfill it. And therefore, if you take the Old Testament away, you are now delegitimizing what Christ did, because Christ fulfilled what was before. So if you want to fulfill what was before, and then you want to build on it, you can't remove the foundation. Therefore, we need to be walking. And the Old Testament is a beautiful place to study and see the heart of God. Because one of the other things we can take away from Scripture is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, I, And I've actually heard this. Well, the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. No, he's not. Same God. The same God that swallowed up a whole bunch of Jews for being whiners. That was their sin, whining. They were whining to God, and God's like, oh, okay. Opened up the ground and swallowed 3,000 Jews. They all died. It's the same God who sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. Same God. And so you want to you put who Christ is in the context, you, and it says that Christ is, the, is one and the Father are one. If you want to see what the Father's heart is like, you need to have the entire New Testament looked at through the lens of the Old Testament. God is good. And if we can't say God is good to every single chapter and every single verse we read in Scripture, we don't actually believe it. We should be able to look at the moment when, when God looked at Abraham and said, I want you to take your son Isaac up to the top and I want you to sacrifice him. God is good. <laughs> right as he's about to, God stopped him and, and provided a lamb. God is good. I got my uh, stories mixed up a few Sundays ago where I said that God killed all of the prophets of, of Baal. It was actually Elijah who killed all of the prophets of Baal. Sorry, when there's a lot of information going around, I tend to get the stories mixed up a little bit. God did kill a lot of people, but this was not one of the cases. Elijah was the one who killed all of those people. God is good. We have a little Lord of the Rings moment at some point in Scripture when all of the armies go into the trees and all of a sudden the trees kill everybody. You know that's in Scripture? Because it's an evil army. He's like, huh? The trees did this? Or the instance where one of the, one of the warriors walks into an enemy camp and all of the enemy is so confused that they literally kill all of each other. They didn't have to kill anybody because the entire enemy camp just ends up killing each other. There's a lot of killing in Scripture. But you know why that's there? Is because God is good and the world is not. And when you have to deal with what is evil in the world, God's the ultimate judge. He's the ultimate cleanser. We sit and we say, God, why is there so much evil in the world? And the world says, well, if God was real, evil would be gone. Not knowing that when God removes evil, he's removing anybody who's serving it. I serve a God who will one day establish the kingdom on earth and there will be no more evil. But I don't want to be on the other side of the fence when that king comes. I want to be a servant of the victor, not a victim of the victor. How do you get there? Authority. We're going to go look at, sorry, rabbit trail. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 34. Does everybody know who Saul is? Old Testament Saul. He was one of the kings of Israel. We're going to read about him. <sighs> Buckle up. Then Samuel said to Saul, Samuel is a prophet of God, okay? So in that day, you had prophets who would speak the word to men, and they would represent the word of God to men. They were not, I'm going to say this, they were not people of authority. 
They were mouthpieces. They had no authority to enact anything. All they were to do is to speak what God said. That's it. After that, God did the rest. Then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people. This is a good sign. Saul, I'm going to be king. Cool. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. This is what the Lord of armies says. I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel is in that he obstructed him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Okay, so now we get another one of those things. Every time we read something that feels off, I want you to remind yourself God is good. God's like, I'm going to punish these people for doing something. Okay, God is good. Right? Keep this in mind. Every time you read scripture, God is good. God is good. God is good. Never let that leave. Because if you can't trust the greatest authority in your life, you'll never walk in authority. Now go and strike Amalek and completely destroy everything that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman and child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. God is good. (laughs) This is probably a hard message for some to hear. How can my God do that? God is good. Then Saul summoned the people and counted them in in Telaim. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. This is a massive army. To put that into perspective, take Medicine Hat, multiply it by four. Every citizen in Medicine Hat, multiply it by four, and you now have the army he just assembled. Massive. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the wadi. But Saul said to the Kenites, Go, get away, go down from among the Amalekites, so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they went up from Egypt. So the the Kenites got away from among the Amalekites. Then Saul defeated the Amalekites from Hevala going to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of Amalekites, alive. And completely destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agog and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the more val- valuable animals, the lambs and everything that was good, and were unwilling to destroy them completely. But everything despicable and weak that they completely destroyed. I want to pause there for a moment. How many times do we do what Saul just did? Where we look at what God called us to do and we pause. We say, wait a minute, God. What you're asking me to do can't possibly be good. And so I'm going to do what I think is good instead of what you're saying is good. (laughs) This is what Saul did. He refused to kill all the animals. He only killed the weak ones. He refused to kill the king. He had his reasons. How often do we do this? Where we'll look at what God says. Well, God, I just can't talk to my friend about you because what happens if they don't like me anymore? What happens if I lose my relationship with them? God looks at you. And we're going to keep reading. And I'm going to show you what God's heart is on this matter. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Who's Samuel? The prophet. What's the prophet's job? Mouthpiece. He's God's mouthpiece, okay? I regret that I have made you, Saul, the king. Because he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was furious and cried out to the Lord all night. God regrets making Saul king. I never want God to look at me and say, I regret giving you a position of authority, Jeremiah, because you're not walking in obedience. What was the reason? I regret that I have made Saul king. This is God talking. Because. The because is, this is why he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my command. And Samuel was furious and cried out to the Lord all night. God wants our obedience. It's so, so, so important that we obey the commands of God. Not because it's this 
holier than thou rules and regulations and God wants soldiers. God wants people who value what he values, who love what he loves, who say, God, you created the law and because you created the law, I'll love it the way I love you. Samuel got up early in the morning to meet Saul and it was reported to Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. So Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. Saul doesn't even... Saul's just blatantly like, I did what you asked. (laughs) But Samuel said, What then is that bleating of the sheep in my ears and the bellowing of oxen which I hear? Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Who's God? Your God. This rings some bells for you. You know what he didn't say? For the Lord my God. Uh Uh-oh. Now you're stepping into dangerous territory. For the Lord your God, but the rest we have completely destroyed. How often do we do this as Christians? But God, I did all of this for you. I sinned for you. God, I went to that party for you. I got drunk so that I could have a drunk conversation with one of my friends for you. How often do we do this? You see, it sounds ridiculous when we say it like this, but in the moment, sometimes we justify our sin because it's what our flesh wants. Because we, and then we try to say, well, God, I did it for you so that I could come around and say, well, look, I got to tell all these people about Jesus. No, 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 no. God wanted you to represent all of who he is, not just say the word Jesus in a bar. Saul said, they have brought them, er, and completely destroyed. So verse 16, then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Let me inform you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak. So Samuel said, it is not true, though you were insignificant in your own eyes, that you became the head of the tribes of Israel. For the Lord anointed you as king over Israel. And the Lord God sent you on a mission and said, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are eliminated. God is good. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Instead, you loudly rushed upon the spoils and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. We don't get to define good. God does. What looks good, if you weren't the king of Israel, you were some peasant in the army, you were one of the soldiers, and you saw that your king spared all the best of the animals and did all of these things right and didn't kill the king, you'd be looking at the king and be like, woohoo, good job, way to go, Saul. Right? Because he's doing good deeds. And Samuel, the voice of God said, you've done evil in my mind. But Jeremiah, we're going out as the church and we're feeding the poor and we're giving them all of these things and we're giving them clothes and we're giving them cakes and we're giving them food and we're representing the kingdom of God and we're doing all of this stuff. Great. Did you tell them to repent? Because if not, you're doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Ouch. Because God's not interested in filling bellies. He's interested in saving souls. God's not interested in clothing the warm. He's interested in in saving souls. I've heard so many people say, well, we're going to look at what Jesus said in the New Testament where it said, if I was naked and you clothed me, if I was in jail, you came to visit me, and all of this stuff. You know what that's referring to? It's referring to brothers and sisters. If you are in Christ and you see one of your brothers naked, clothe him. Because you know what? Believe it or not, we are not an inclusive group, we Christians. We follow the way of the Father. This is why they were called the followers of the way during the Bible times. 
because there was a way to go. This is why the church lacked nothing. You want to know why the church, there's so many churches today that are poor? Because we give everything we have to the world and we save none for ourselves. God said, I commanded you to give tithes and offerings so that when the widows, the broken, the people who couldn't afford to live come to you and they're my people, you can take care of them. This is how God established the way to take care of those within the, the body of Christ. We have been foolish and irresponsible by taking the wealth of God and giving it to the people we're not supposed to give it to. Our job is to take care of our own. And the only thing we have to offer the world is light and salt. Truth. Jeremiah, does that mean that we shouldn't be a good citizen? Not at all. You see somebody on the side of the road, regardless of who they are, help them out. But what we do with God's money should be in line with God's commands. What we do with our time should be in line with God's commands. Who we put in our lives as relationships should be in line with God's commands. If I have somebody in my life, and I can tell you this, I grew up insecure. Extremely insecure in who I was. And one of the things that I did is I ended up having friends who didn't follow God. And you know what happened when I had friends who didn't follow God? Is I made compromises in my own life so that I could please those who don't follow God. It wasn't until I started to mature that I started to see that my following God meant I had to lose these relationships. Because I can't go and say the things you say. I can't go and do the things you do. I can't go and be the person you're being. I can't believe the way you believe. I can't accept the things you accept. I can't stand by idly and say nothing while the world around me crumbles. Because I have a job to do. I have authority to do something and I need to step up and do it. So many of us want authority. Let me tell you this. Don't ask God for a sword unless you're willing to use it. Because if God gives you a sword and you do nothing with it, you have now become a steward that does nothing with what God's given you. And that's worse than never having had the sword to begin with. Well, Jeremiah, where do you see that in Scripture? The parable of the talents. The master gave one one, one two, and one five. The one who had five doubled it. And the master looked at him and said, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to put you in charge of cities. The one who had two doubled it. So he ended up with four. And the master looked at him and said, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to put you in charge of cities. The one who had one buried it in the ground. He had authority over that one talent. He buried it in the ground. And then when he brought it back up, he said, well, master, I was so scared you were going to get upset with me if I did nothing with it that I didn't use it. And the master came back and said, you could have invested it into a bank and gotten interest on it at least and had something, but you didn't. You, were, you had the wrong perspective. You wicked and evil servant. He was given something, did nothing with it, and God looked at him and said, how dare you? Whoa. Trust me, the kid, I, love the, I love God's presence. When you're in his presence, everything else fades away. God is good. I love his presence. There's peace, there's love, there's joy, there's patience, there's kindness, there's goodness, faithfulness, self-control. All of these things are fruits of the Spirit that come from being planted in who he is. But the part about being planted is that you have to be responsible with what he gave you. When you're responsible with what he gave you, he blesses you with everything that comes with the kingdom. Did, we like to think, well, God, God I'm just going to profess that God will bless me and it's going to happen. Let me ask you something. Did that happen to Saul? What did God do to Saul? Where did I leave off? Verse 19. We're going to go to verse 18. And the, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are eliminated. Verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Instead, you loudly rushed upon the spoils and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And verse 20. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord, for I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have completely destroyed the Amalekites. 
But the people took some of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things designated for destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God again, not my God, your God at Gilgal. <laughs> What's Samuel doing? Wait a minute, God, or Samuel. It wasn't my fault. The people took stuff. The people did this for your sake, God. They took all of these spoils so they could sacrifice them to you. You see how manipulative that sounds? God's no dummy. And we do this as Christians all too often. Well, God, it was my surroundings. It was that wife you gave me. Where else did we hear that, Adam? Well, God, it's the wife you gave me. That's why I ate the fruit. God ain't interested in your excuses. When he puts you in authority, you have a responsibility to walk in that authority. It's really quiet in here today. Verse 22. So Saul gave his rebuttal. Well, it's the people's fault. Blah, 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 blah. It's all Samuel heard. Now we're going to read God's response through Samuel. Samuel said, does the Lord have as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as reprehensible as the sin of divination and insubordination is as reprehensible as false religion and idolatry. Since you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. For I have violated the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people. Because I feared the people. I made this statement a while back and it rings true today. You cannot have a greater fear of God than you do of man. Because if you have a greater fear of man than you do of God, you'll never obey God. You'll obey man. Where's that in scripture? Because I have feared the people and listened to the Listen to their voice. This is so applicable to today, people. The people says that we're, we're supposed to be this loving, tolerant, acceptant. We're going to just teach the love of Jesus, lovey-dovey, butterflies and, and unicorns and toots and all that good stuff. No. God prefers obedience over sacrifice. If that was true then, and if God's the same yesterday, today, and forever... What do you think God prefers today? The same thing. Where is that in Scripture? Okay. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, you will what? Obey my commands. It's all there. All the good stuff about Christianity exists, but it's prerequisite by a people who are obedient to the king. If you want to say, God, you are my God, you also need to be able to say, I'll be your people. Because you can't say, God, you'll be my God and not be his people. It doesn't work that way. Then you look like Saul. Saul. And God will look at you and say, well, you were disobedient. I told you to do this, you didn't do it. I told you to do this, you didn't do it. I told you to do this, you didn't do it. And what I love is that, is it, where does it say that? And I have sinned. I have sinned. God, I have indeed transgressed the commands of the Lord in your words. He apologized. Well, all you, all you got to do today is you just got to apologize and God will forgive you and you can do whatever you want. It didn't work for Saul. Did it. He lost everything. Authority requires obedience. Where was I? 25. Let's go to 25. Now then, please pardon my sin and return with me so that I may worship the Lord. This is Saul speaking. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Then Samuel turned to go, but Saul grasped the edge of his robe and tore it off. 
obviously Saul's a little grumpier at this point. Verse 28, so Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. But I thought we were all the same in God's eyes. Apparently not. We all have the same value in that God died for each and every one of us, but we don't all have the same purpose and we don't all have the same authority. And what you do plays into your authority and purpose. It has to. Because God created it that way. He has given it to your neighbor for he is better than you. Verse 20, and also the glory of Israel will not lie nor change his mind. For he is not a man that would change his mind. So Israel in this case is referring to God. God will not change his mind. That's what it's saying. Then Saul said, I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before all Israel and go back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Ah, now he's going back to, yeah, okay, I'll acknowledge this. It's your God. So Samuel went back following Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. He thinks he's good. He came to him cheerfully, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is gone. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so that your mother be childless among you. And Samuel cut Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Samuel the prophet chopped him up like sushi before the Lord. Everybody say, God is good. <laughs> God is good. But I love it because it says, here's your, penal- here, here's your sin. Here's your penalty. What are the wages of sin? When you don't stand with God, you will reap the rewards of your sin. Verse 34, Then Samuel went to Ramah, but Saul went up from his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. Though Samuel mourned for Saul, the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. God didn't just remove the blessing. God didn't just remove the anointing. He regretted making him king because of disobedience. But Jeremiah, why didn't didn't his apology work? How then are any of us supposed to be saved? Well, I'm gonna, we're not going to have time for it today. But next week, we're going to look at the same time period. Another man who did the same thing Saul did. But God forgave him. Not in the same way, but still an egregious sin. But the difference between the heart of those two men is what made the difference that drew God to one and rejected the other. You see, sometimes we as Christians, we like to put everything, I'll tell you who that king is, that king is King David. Sometimes we like to say, well, God forgave David for all of these egregious sins, so he'll forgive me. The difference was King David was repentant, King Saul was apologetic. One apologized and never had a heart for God, the other one apologized and repented because he had a heart for God. When you read what David says, he says, the Lord my God. When you hear what Saul says, the Lord your God. Who is God in your life? Are you doing it for you or are you doing it for God? In this moment, God had established Saul as king. He had given him a position. He had given him authority. But when Saul overstepped his boundaries and the one who gave him authority, he didn't obey that person, God removed authority. You see, we want to be able to cast out devils. We want to be able to heal the sick and the lame. We want to be able to do all these things as Christians. You want to do that? Walk in obedience first. If we're going we're to look through it a little bit in the New Testament, but I encourage you, start in Matthew, go all the way to Revelation, and find me one person who moved with God where it doesn't preface it with, they were righteous men and women. Find me one. 
where it doesn't say they were obedient, where it doesn't say they loved God, where it doesn't say they gave everything for the kingdom of God. I can find you a couple that didn't do it right, Ananias and Sapphira, and guess what happened? The same thing that happened to Paul or Saul. They died. Holy Spirit killed them. New Testament. Because God is the same yesterday as he is today, as he will be in the future. And if we want to walk in the authority of God, this is, this is where our job comes in. Value. Christ died for me. Yes, I, I, ma- I was bought with a price. This should excite you. Now you have a purpose. Remember, purpose is that showbread. God's like, look at my son. Or look at my daughter. Look at what they're doing. Look at how they live. Look at what they say. Look at how they do things. He's showing you off to the world. Light and salt. Now you have the authority to go out and to do what? Make disciples. You have no right making disciples if you're stuck in sin and refusing to serve God. God's looking for people who are repentant. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I can't, I can't preach that because I'm not perfect. But what I am is repentant. When I screw up, God, forgive me. This hurts your heart. I don't want to be this guy. That's what God's looking for. When I, th- this is one of the things God taught me when I was learning to walk in boldness. God would tell me to go pray for somebody. When I missed it, it was sin. Because I wasn't obedient anymore. I had to repent. God, you know what I did when that happened? God, I'm sorry. I was scared of that person. Please forgive me. And then you know what followed that was, Lord, give me another opportunity to succeed. Sure enough, God brought another person my way and said, I want you to pray for this person. And so I stepped out in in obedience and God moved. But fear created sin. Not f- fear isn't a bad thing. If I had had a greater fear of God than of man, I would have prayed right away. This is true, right? If you were more scared of what God would do to you than you were of what man would do to you, you would obey God without, with, without any issues. But the problem is, is we start to fear man more than we fear God because man is physically present and sometimes we forget that God is also present but we just don't see him. So we're going to continue with authority. We made it through one page. We're going to be on this for a little bit. But God is good. Amen? Thank you, God, for today, for your word, for the authority that you've given your people to go out and be ambassadors. Thank you, Father, that you help us to grow and to increase and to become the people that you've called us to be. Lord God, I thank you for the rest of the week this week. And for those that couldn't be here today, I ask that you would be with them. And I thank you, Father, for safe drives for everybody who's out on the roads. And Lord God, that this next week we would have opportunities to shine and to be a light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.